by a series of four shorter um, wonderings, maybe we'll call them. Thanks, Dan. Okay. Let's give ourselves a moment to begin to appreciate the wonder that's embedded within the Christmas story. Just to appreciate the wonder that goes beyond the baby. And then allow our, allow our minds to ask those questions or to be filled with that glory, with that sense of hugeness of who God is and how much he loves us. And then see where that takes us. So to wrap our minds around this, think of it this way. The, the life force of the universe that generated galaxies and then tended to the specifics of this planet and called each one of us into existence, this, this life force, in order to make his love for us most clear so that we could not only hear words, read words, but see a life lived, this life force that is even now moving through you and reminding you of the reality of this, this life force, to make it clear, he became one of these. He is so cute. God became cute. God became pudgy. God became helpless. God became one who has to trust another to be cared for. God grew up. God made friends. God got hurt. God lived the human life that we live, and he knows what it's like to hurt and to be happy. <clears throat> As he grew to be an adult, he challenged the religious systems. He challenged the hypocrisy, but he always welcomed the sinners, that is, the repeat offenders, the broken, the down and outers, the, the, the outcasts, the religious outcasts. These are the people he gathered to himself, made room for them. He had this infinite forgiveness, and he taught that to his followers, forgiveness. In a broken world where we all keep messing up, forgiveness is going to be key, and he taught that. And then towards the end of his life, he gets together with his disciples, and he gets down on his hands and knees, and he begins to wash their feet. Now, this is God. This is God. just driving the point home of how much he loves us. Hebrews 1, 3 says that the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. The radiance of his glory, his, his thunderbolts and lightning look like this. Just forgiveness and care and embrace and what do we do with that? We reject him, we crucify him, we, we torture him to death, really. And how does he die on the cross? As we are doing everything we can to say, no, thank you. What's he thinking as he's hanging there? What, when we do this to God's love letter to us, how does he respond? He cries out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Still, still. Okay, how about maybe after that, though, then, then he's got to at some point say, enough's enough, it's time for you all to die, right? I mean, that's what the resurrection's got to be about, right? That's his I'll be back moment. He's got to come back and just wipe us out. There's got to be hell to pay. I mean, th on the third day, this happens. You have the empty tomb. Is that good news? But wait, 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 how can it be good news? If, if the tomb stays filled with a dead body, that would be good news because we say we killed the right guy. Now he was an imposter, we killed him, good. If the tomb's empty, it means that humanity, the, the religious and political establishments together made the worst mistake in all of recorded human history. If he comes back to life, we killed the wrong guy and he's vindicated, we're condemned. The resurrection is bad news if he's anything but pure love. If he's anything but pure love, it's bad news. But it's good news if he's going to keep coming at us with even more forgiveness. And now there's even more to forgive. And what does Jesus say at the end of Luke's gospel? He says this. He, he talks about all of Scripture pointing to this moment. And he says to his disciples, 
This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. There's only one thing you need to go and tell people after all of this that you've done to me is forgiveness, forgiveness. This is my heart. This is the shape love takes to a broken and messed up world. So when I think of the Christmas story, to me that's a story of God placing his faith in us. And the fact that of all the forms that he chose to present himself, he chose to come into this world not as a powerful and omnipotent being, but as a vulnerable, young, defenseless baby that he entrusted with us to raise, to take care of, and to protect. And he did it at a time when the world was a violent place, full of, a lot, full of chaos and full of a lot of pain. And I think we forget that. And I think, I think it's amazing the fact that despite that, he still believed that we would do the right thing to take care of this child and to protect him and to love him the way that he loved us. I think Christmas has become a bit too sterilized, and um, in that, something has been lost, something of great importance. Uh, you know, we, we sing Christmas carols. Uh, with There's this Christmas song I love, and the lyrics go, The first time that you opened your eyes, did you realize that you would be my savior? And the first breath that left your lips, did you know that it would change this world forever? And when I hear those lyrics, I think about um, Jesus coming as a baby, and just how vulnerable and uh, helpless he was um, to be not able to speak, to not be able to do anything for himself. And as a nursing student, I've witnessed childbirth, and even though it's beautiful afterwards, it's a really messy and really difficult process. Um, and I think Jesus chose the most difficult way he could have to enter this world. Um, but I think it's really beautiful because that just showcases the lengths that he would go um, to show us the love that he has for us. I think that's a really beautiful part of the Christmas story. Jesus enters the world through an unmarried teenage girl in a small village. And to me, that brings me so much hope because it shows that Jesus would use someone that seems so insignificant to the world and uses her for such a significant part in his story. And I can see that through my life. In times when I feel like I'm not where I want to be, I know that God is always with me and that he uses those seasons to glorify his kingdom. And that brings me so much hope and I'm so reminded of that in the Christmas season. It's hard to believe that God with us, um, especially uh, when you watch the news and you watch the world around us. Uh, there's so much pain, uh, so much hurt going on, and uh, sometimes there's things that happen that we don't understand at all. And uh, for me, it definitely comes down to faith. Um, the Bible tells us that um, uh, God is with us uh, through trials and tribulations, uh, through every ups and downs that we go through in life. And uh, that's where I draw my inspiration from. Seeing his love uh, shown through people. Um, uh, God uses uh, people as tools to communicate with us, uh, to, to speak into our lives. And, uh, and I can draw inspiration from that. Uh, looking at other people and seeing God through them is a big way that, uh, that proves me that he is with us.
So there you go. There's some things to ponder and think about. Um, we have time for a couple more songs if you'd like to uh, pick a favorite. Matt. <laughs> 